what they were known as new vehicle projects people, what 4x4s were about. So we decided to take 15 or 20 Land Rovers down to East North and some competitive vehicles, Nissan, Toyota, Bronco, International Scout. We did a two-day safari and convinced them of the off-road abilities of Land Rover and in some cases the lack of off-road ability of some of the competition. The team was convinced and King led the development. They built several prototypes with decoy names such as Velar and Road Rover and finally settled on the one that became the world-renowned Range Rover. The next step was to convince the board of directors to build it. One of the first demonstration dives was to have this dramatic entry of the red number six prototype down a grassy bank where we got all of the directors. Roger Craythorne realized it would take a clever presentation to impress the board, using one of the most basic rules of salesmanship. It's like most things, if you've got to sell a new design, you need to show people um, and not just tell them. So, you know, uh, pictures tell a lot of um, stories about just how well things work. We basically took the body off a Range Rover, put a, a roll cage on for safety, uh, loaded it to the correct unladen weight. The unique rolling chassis clearly showed the innovative long travel coil spring suspension and live axle location. The setup provided a more comfortable ride and even better off-road capability. The newly acquired V8 engine was powerful and lightweight. Permanent four-wheel drive gave it predictable handling. Disc brakes were fitted for the first time on a vehicle of this type, as was a load leveling device between the rear axle and the chassis. But Spen had one more goal. To make it more smooth and acceptable looking in appearance. And I think we succeeded. The new Range Rover was launched in June 1970. And like the little Land Rover in 1948, it became the new European automotive rage. It claimed numerous design awards and was even hailed at the Louvre in Paris as automotive art.